Thank you, Okay. Uh, and, and we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Daddy God, uh, I thank you that we can call you Father. I thank you that we know you and we can relate to you and relate with you. And also you with us, which is very, very important. I thank you for this day that we celebrate today, which is your son, Jesus Christ, risen and uh, ascended to be with you, Father, to return oh so shortly. I thank you that uh, we <clears throat> learn more and more to have a thankful heart as we grow closer to you and focus on the things that we've been given, the things that we've been spared from and directed to. But above all, Father, I thank you that you have given us and shown us a relationship with you. So thanks for the teaching we're having tonight, for uh, Philip and for whatever he's got to share with us, and just that our ears and spiritual eyes being open to what you have to say to us personally. Thank you for this and in the Son Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Um. Right, so we'll, before we start with our first song, let's um, just have a quick look at the verses um, for the year and uh, the month. Um, did that show? Okay. I'm um, so, Hello? Hello, yes, it's me. <laughs> just, sorry, carry on. You can, you can see it, yes. yes. Um, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Um, and that's from Isaiah 55, verse 6. And uh, the verse for, for March, um, obviously it will change tomorrow. Um, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Um, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. So just thank the Lord for his word. Um, right, so let's um, have our first hymn, shall we? Um, Submit the audio sound. Sorry, give me half a second. At least we didn't actually start the singing first. <laughs> right.
So, um, yes, it's a wonderful weekend, isn't it? I mean, every week we do um, consider and reflect and give thanks to the Lord on um, his death and resurrection and the price paid for us um, when we when we share around the Lord's table. But um, it's a wonderful opportunity that the whole world has in its calendar, the remembrance of what Christ did. And even though not everybody understands that anymore, <laughs> it does give us the opportunity to tell people about Jesus, doesn't it, that this weekend is in the calendar. Um, I'm sure they've got the dates all wrong, but um, nevertheless, there is this acknowledgement of, of the Son of God who gave his life for the whole world, um, that we might know our Father, we might have our sins forgiven, and we might earn a salvation through him. So, um, yes, we're grateful for the Easter weekend. Um, has anybody got anything they'd like to share that the Lord's blessed them with, encouraged them with? It'd be good to hear um, anything the Lord's done for you this week. Wendy, I've got a few connecting scriptures, if that's all right, um, mm -hmm. to read out. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh. Go ahead. You, you can. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's lovely. You can hear me now. Great. Um, it starts off in Jeremiah, um, and it's been, it's chapter 12, and the Lord has just um, been talking about how, how utterly wicked Israel has become, um, which is just like us. And, but these scriptures are all about the Lord's soul, soul of the Lord, and how beautiful his soul is. And we are the opposite without him. Um, the Lord says, I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul. I love that word, the dearly beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. And, and then I'm reading Isaiah 38, verse 17, Hezekiah's prayer. Um, again, indeed, it was for my own peace of in love to my soul. Freed my soul from the bit of corruption, from the pit of corruption, freed me, delivered me from the pit of corruption. So in love to our soul, the Lord has a beautiful soul. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. And mm -hmm. then Isaiah 53, verses 10 to 12, uh, again about the soul of the Lord. Yet it pleased the, the Lord to bruise him, the Lord Jesus. He has put him to grief. When you, the Lord, make his soul, the Lord Jesus' soul, an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in Jesus' hands. Um, and then verse 11, Jesus shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And then verse 12, Therefore, I, the Lord, will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because the Lord Jesus poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors and bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And then our corrupt souls have been set free, haven't they, like Mary? And she says in Luke 1, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my saviour. For he who is mighty has done great things and holy is his name. Just lost. So, Geraldine, we've lost the very last bit of what you were saying. Oh, oh can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I, had I got to Mary? Yes, oh, you've just gone um, Mary, my soul. Oh, you got me all. You've got, you got it all. It was just her, her lovely song of praise. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my yeah. spirit has rejoiced in God, my Saviour. Yeah. Thank you very much. He who is mighty has done great things. 
and holiness is Yes, his mercy is on those who fear him. That's it. Yes. Thank you. Yes, and um, while you were speaking, I just um, remembered a, a hymn called, um, well, the chorus goes, um, blotted them out. Um, God has blotted them out. God has blotted them out. Uh, my sins like a cloud hung over me. Um, he blotted them out when he set me free. God has blotted them out. God has blotted them out. And I, it comes from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud by transgressions and as a cloud by sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O, o ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Um, thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer. <laughs> um, yeah. Wonderful, isn't it? And 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 I love that. you know, it is good to look at um everything that, that um happens at Calvary and, and after um to just remind us of the price that was paid and uh what the Lord has, has wrought for us, really, the freedom from sin. Um we couldn't do any of it for ourselves at all. <laughs> so really grateful. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anything that's blessed you? Well, let's have the, the next song then, shall we? Um, Church of Christ 
Yeah, I love that song. Um, I think the last verse has to be read in the context of Revelation 20. <laughs> um, right, so um, if, if has anybody got um, anything that they wanted to share before we listen to Philip? No, okay, then let's do that. Mm -hmm. Well, brethren, good evening and a very happy Easter to you all, as I realise that this message will be being played on Easter Sunday. Well, before we turn once again to Daniel chapter 12, shall we just pray and thank God for our time together? Lord, we thank you that you have uh, spoken and all this is coming to be. And we thank you for this joyful day that we remember where death is vanquished. Tell it with joy, you righteous. And so we thank you now that we have this time to sit at the feet of Christ, we pray you keep us from other cares, from distractions. But Lord, we look to you, that great shepherd of the sheep, that you would feed us with the bread of life this night. Amen. Well, I thank God by God's good design that we actually come without any design of my own. And in fact, I didn't design it this way, certainly. But we actually come to on, Re on Resurrection Sunday, this Easter Sunday evening, to Daniel chapter 12 and the resurrection of the wise and this glorious passage in Daniel chapter 12. Now I know that I've slowed down a little bit over the last few weeks um, and I will speed up and Lord willing finish uh, Daniel. But nonetheless, Daniel chapter 12 and verse three, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever and and something that i'd like to look at tonight is the resurrection of the wise and, and this glorious description that is given to daniel about how the wise will be the, they'll be like the brightness of the ferment and that you know you could say as bright as the sky and as the heavens and then shining as the stars in their brightness and I'd like to look at just a few things tonight about this matter, about the resurrection of the of the wise, of the justice that's here described, and of the great hope that we have for that which is ahead. And uh, and the first thing I'd like to say about this truth is that it is the elevation of the Christian from the earth uh, to the sky, to the heavens, and uh, the resurrection, the rising, not only that life would begin, but that will be elevated to the heavens. And, and there are many scriptures that talk about this, aren't there? But I think one of the wonderful ones is, is in Philippians 3 and verse 21. I was in the scripture just this week where he says, for our conversation is in heaven. This is where our true future and present conversation is. From whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able, sorry, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Do you see that transformation he describes there? To take, to change the Lord Jesus Christ will change our vile body and make it like unto his glorious body. And the word vile maybe, maybe uh, is slightly unclear about it because he can sometimes 
used, as we found earlier in Daniel, it re referred to uh, this man Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, and it describes him as a vile man. And we might say, well, is that is that what it means here as well? That one really of, of immorality, abominable. No, it actually talks about the lower state of our body. And, and in fact, you can see the same words is in Acts chapter 8 and verse 53, where it says of Christ, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, that as Christ humbled himself in his humble, in his vile, lowly state, you might say, the lower state of Christ. And, and that's what he's saying, he will take us now from our lowliest state that we are in and elevate, ascend, rise us to this glorious state. We might bear his image, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And this resurrection he's talking about, and I'm going to say some simple things tonight, but nonetheless, it's good to have it in our, our mind, of course, will take place at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the resurrection and the life. And, and in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And there's an order that's given here, isn't there? That the dead in Christ will rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And it's that same idea, isn't it, that we've been taken from the earth and raised up to the heavens, to the stars, to where Christ is. And, and we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last shout, at the last trump, forgive me. As Christ descends with the shout of an archangel, it, so the sequence is that those who have fallen asleep in Christ, we might say like Lazarus, will at that trump will immediately rise from the dead. And then both the living Christians and those Christians who have fallen asleep, who have died previously, will rise up together to meet Christ in the air and as that happens in a moment in the twinkle of an eye our mortal bodies will be transformed made like unto christ's glorious body you see that's it that our vile our lowly estate will at that instant be transformed by the power of christ who is able to work all things after the power of his will and he will do that in just the twinkle of an eye now Brethren, sometimes some brethren are offended, we might say, and as their trouble and sorrow goes on for many years, they would sometimes begin in their heart to say, why doesn't God end my suffering? That is, why doesn't he deliver me? Why doesn't he heal me now? Because we can see that Christ has the power in the twinkle of an eye instantly to transform every single living Christian and every single dead Christian like unto his glorious body. I love the how when a miracle happens today, we are so full of joy, aren't we? But sometimes we're, if we're truthful with ourselves, we're surprised because we didn't believe that God would do it. And maybe even we've thought that God can't do it. Can't do it. And it's rather like how the apostles respond in the book of acts and they he says you know why i think it something miraculous that god should raise the dead it, it's nothing uh, uh, incredible for god it, it he will transform every single believer remove every element their body all of our bodies will instantaneously the immortality will be cast off and in a moment he will put on we will put on our mortality will be cast off but in a moment Every single one of us will have immortality put on. And, and why then does God not instantly heal every believer now? And some are offended by this. Well, the answer is, of course, that it will take place on that great day. And brother, let's not stumble or be offended in this matter, because there are some who teach that the Christian life is one void of suffering. And in fact, if you have any form of sickness, its root is only from sin. And it is not the will of God. All the will of God is for you to be perfectly healthy and whole. Well, brethren, it is, but not until that last day 
when Christ returns. And I'm not better learning, looking to Christ for healing because the one who will one day transform every one of our bodies is able also to do that now. And we ought to pray for the sick, aren't we, that they might be healed. But it might be that sometimes God does not lift our suffering now because he's appointed the day when it will surely happen. I think one of the people who had one of the clearest visions and sights of this is, is Fanny Crosby. And I use that language deliberately because this uh, lady, as you know, was blind from her youth uh, and her, her sight was never healed. But the spiritual height, sight that she had was quite remarkable. And she wrote one of these lovely hymns that I'll read to you. When the trump of the great archangel, its mighty tones shall sound and the end of age proclaiming shall pierce the depths profound. When the son of man shall come in his glory to take the saints on high, what a shouting in the skies from the multitudes that rise, changed in the twinkling of an eye, changed in the twinkling of an eye, changed in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, changed in the twinkling of an eye. And the last verse that I'll read, verse two, when he comes in the clouds descending and they who loved him here from their graves shall awake and praise him with joy and not with fear when the body and the soul united and clothed no more to die what a shouting there will be when each other's faces we see changed in the twinkling of an eye you see uh, that is the hope that is when it will take place fanny crosby had it didn't it that it's not necessary now brethren that he will deliver us but he will on that great day as the book of james says he says be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the Lord. It is at that moment when Christ will descend, the dead will rise, and we which are alive when he comes will together be caught up to meet him in the air and may like unto his glorious body, may like unto God. Light, uh, those things that are like the brightness of the firmament. And if you look at the bright sky and the light that is there that God has made and then the stars that reflect the, the glory of the sun, the glory of God, that we will be like, we will not supersede him, not for one moment, that's far from what I mean, but we'll be like unto his glorious body. That's what it means, isn't it? That we will be like he is, full of light, made like our heavenly father. It would be blasphemous to say that, wouldn't it? Uh, and were it not that the scripture says it, but on that day when Christ rose from the dead and spoke to his disciples, he says, I go now to, to my father and your father, to my God and your God. See, he's made us now the sons of God. And it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will be transformed in a moment. And my last point on this section is that he will take us from our lowly estate now. And brethren, it's good, isn't it, to humble ourselves as the mighty hand of God. And he'll make us like the angels in heaven, uh, transformed in our immortal bodies. And isn't that striking? It's the opposite, isn't it, what happened to the devil? Well, the devil was like one of them, and he said, I will be like the most high. And at that instantaneous moment, he was cast out of heaven like lightning. But God has saying the opposite will happen to us. He has said that he will make us like unto his glorious body. In the twink of an eye, like a flash of lightning, we will be transformed, propelled up into heaven. This is the great work of Christ upon the cross, the great fruit of his resurrection, that death's sting has been broken. As the hymn writer, another hymn writer says, tell it with joy, you righteous. Isn't it true that we should rejoice in these things? But, but if I might say, secondly, a very important question, because as we saw last week, there's a resurrection of the just and also of the unjust. Every one of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and then we'll either live in eternal shame and contempt or in eternal life. Therefore, isn't it the most important question? Who then? Who then are these? who take part 
in this resurrection of the righteous. Because verse 3 has some qualification, doesn't it? It is not a universal rising to life, an everlasting life. But he says, they that be wise. And later on down, they that turn many to righteousness. It is those who will rise to this great life and this great eternal life. And isn't it, therefore, the most important question when I know exactly who these wise are, these that turn many to righteousness. And we don't have to go far to look back at the scriptures. Remember, I may have said a few weeks ago that chapter 11 through 12 are all a single passage, really, a single period of uh, of revelation. And if you look back in chapter 11, you have a little description. uh, You have some indications about who the wise are. In verse 31, he says, sorry, verse 33, sorry, forgive me, verse 32, they, the people that do know their gods shall be strong. And then verse 33, you have, they that understand among the people. And in verse 35, and some of them of understanding. And the word understanding there is wise. It's the same group of people we find therefore that they are the the wise are those of understanding who have heard what god says and built their house upon that rock and then back in our chapter in chapter 12 and verse 10 he joins the wise and the understanding together he says and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand the wise are those who hear what God says here in the book of Daniel, who despite seeing the great falling away, the great rise of the Antichrist, that the world seems to rage against God and the unrighteous seem to prevail and the righteous seem foolish, but the opposite is the truth. But above all than that, that they are wise unto salvation. That is that they have searched the scriptures And they realize that they speak not of the Antichrist, but primarily of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who will be the saver. And having read and searched into these things, they have been given faith by hearing these and they've been made wise unto salvation. They are wise also. And that they realize that the things that they see here now are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal, as 1 Corinthians uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18 says that, that which is visible is temporal, it's temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And isn't that just that it? That this group of people have realized that they must sell everything to buy the truth, that what Christ said is true. They will not be beguiled by the things of this world, the things that are temporary, but they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They will cleave to him. They will stand firm in him. They are those who are wise. It's not saying do we know the Greek philosophers, do we know all these things, but it's those who have responded, who have heard and believed and responded to what Christ has said, who therefore have built their house upon a rock, the wise builders, who therefore will be in this resurrection. They've realized, haven't they, that the things on this earth are temporary, but the things of the future are eternal. And that is what they seek to wise. I actually found out that uh, there's that great quote by the missionary, Jim Elliott, who, as you know, went to be a missionary in South Africa, South America. And he was there, he died, and was, uh, I suppose, martyred for his work as a missionary. He, he gave up his life to go to be a missionary, and then he lost his life, as some would say it, killed by the people, some of the people whom he had gone to save. And he, this quote is often quoted, isn't it? But this is a a great description of what it is to be wise. He says, he is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And I was very interested that actually some attribute the original quote of this to the father of none, none, no one else other than Matthew Henry, the great commentator of the Bible, who wrote this um, many years before. And it's lovely to think that Jim Elliot 
read this book and then uh, and then it became something of a statement to himself it pressed on his heart but the father of matthew henry said he is no fool who parts with that which he cannot keep when he is sure to be recompensed with that which he cannot lose is another great understand a description of those who are wise who are of understanding well thirdly and i won't be much longer today uh, that is it will be everlasting he says in verse three that they will be as the stars for ever and ever so there will be no end to the life that christ gives because on the cross death is vanquished and the last thing that will happen when christ returns is that death will be swallowed up in victory and it will never again feature the devil will have been destroyed and will be in hell and his angels we will be transformed like unto his glorious body there's no possibility that death could ever return and its effects are utterly washed away he will have made all things new a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness and so we will shine as the stars for ever and ever and i know brethren we can't understand this and it's not something we can compute we're born aren't we with an understanding of that our the days of our lives will be three school years and 10 70 years and maybe eight if we're strong and maybe a little longer now with medicine but we all know that one day that we always grow old and that, that death follows and we, we are only always bound by time aren't we it's something that we can't experience and know about but let me tell you that's not entirely true because isn't there if we're a child of god the spirit within us that though with our heads we can't explain it and understand it and say what does it mean forever and ever i mean how how will that be how can i go on forever we can't answer that can we but within our hearts isn't it true that the spirit of god cries out yay amen and and we have that deposit within us that presses that knows without explanation that this is true that that day will come when we will be with our father in heaven when we will be with the lord jesus christ where there will be righteousness only the curse will be no more and we'll be as the stars in their brightness as the brightness of the ferment for ever and ever as he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 so shall we ever be with the Lord without end death is vanquished tell it with the joy you righteous and this is the great purpose of God in salvation we sometimes think uh, what I mean by that is everlasting life this gathering of, of the saints together in Christ this is of course his great purpose because sometimes we can preach a message and think as though really it is only about now about now be forgiven be reconciled to God and then live a life of fruitful service to God and and that is true isn't it but isn't it ultimately the will of God when will the will of God be fulfilled it is when all his saints are gathered in Christ in heavenly places that the end will come that the great plan of salvation will have been finished the great resurrection when it takes place the great assembly the final trump the final gathering together and if you haven't got a moment then if you've got a moment then look at how the trumpet was used in the old testament law to call the solemn assemblies there and look at how the trumpets are used and this is the final trump the final gathering together the great gathering together when we will be evermore with the lord this is god's purpose his ultimate purpose for the world and that of salvation let's not have a view of salvation that is limited only to the the innumerable benefits that there are now but that is not it alone it is that which is to come as he says in, in ephesians chapter one and verse eight verse nine having known answers the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself that so what is what is the mystery of his will and he says this in verse 10 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So brethren, our inheritance, the reward that Christ has got for us is not on earth, but it is in the world that is to come in heavenly places. We've been chosen for those for that, to receive eternal life, and we will receive it at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I might say finally, uh, my last point tonight, back in Daniel chapter 3, what until that day? Well, he says this, they that be righteous shall be, sorry, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. And I love that little phrase that's there, that turn many to righteousness. As that's talking about the effect of the righteous, of the wise's lives and witness on those who are around. You see, until that great day of Christ, brethren, we have that great commission, don't we? Whereby we are able, I'm not saying that we have the power ourselves, but the message that God has given us, the means that God has given us, is able to turn many to righteousness. Isn't it true that he who wins souls is, is wise? Think of the effect. Why is it that God tarries, that Christ tarries? Is it not this great commission that we might yet turn many to righteousness? Thank God of the wonder of the gospel that he's given us, the, the message of reconciliation, that we can turn many from everlasting contempt and shame to this life where they might receive life everlasting. This is the power of the gospel. And I think it's very fitting that after Christ's resurrection and before his ascension, when he gives his final instructions to the disciples on the, on the Mount of Olives, where I, I believe many rightly believe that somehow he will return to, where his return will be centred to. And he gives them the very similar instructions, uh, where he's just about to be received up into heaven, into the clouds, and the clouds receive him from his, from his sight, and in the same way that Christ will come with the clouds and we will see him. But what's the instruction that he gave them? But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, and here in Daniel 12, we have a similar reminder, brethren, you're not just to stand there looking up, waiting for your salvation, rejoicing in that day. Though, no, brethren, we are to do that partly, but we're also to be laboring for Christ, to be preaching the gospel, praying for the gospel, turning many unto righteousness, as we can do that, can't we, by the power of the gospel, that when they receive Christ, they can be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ. That is what we're to be doing. And this is where the power of Christ now abides in our work of evangelism, rescuing the perishing, plucking them out of the fire, even up to that last moment, pulling as many as we can, turning from unrighteousness, from wickedness, to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they too might shine as the firmament and the stars forever and ever. And this is the great challenge, the great, great question to all of us, not as, will I be knowledgeable, will I know these things, but how will I respond? Will I be wise and hear these things? these simple things and put them into practice because great will be that day where Christ returns, where the dead in Christ and we shall be raised incorruptible and ever be with the Lord. Let us be patient, brethren, unto that great and glorious day, the certainty of the resurrection and the resurrection of the wise. God bless you and good night. Thankful to the Lord for the messages given Philip to share with us tonight.
tonight. Um, let's um, just have our last hymn and uh, Dad would close in prayer after that. Um, and uh, if anybody's got time to just have a, a small time prayer afterwards, you're very welcome to to um, stay and, and join us. Let's just... Thank you, Dad. Your Heavenly Father, we thank you for the this great, greatest of events, or the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, you've made it clear in your holy word that if, if Christ is not risen, we are still in our sins. It was that confirmation of the sinless soul of your Son as an acceptable sacrifice, as a payment for our debt. And death could not hold him, for there was no guilt. And we praise you for the absolute certainty, the truth of it, Lord, and the power of it. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be among the wise, and even yet to turn many to righteousness as we resort to you in prayer, in obedience, in a way that our hearts are changed by the influence of the Holy Ghost. We pray, Lord, that you would help us have that wisdom uh, of those who save, that, that he that winneth, soul, winneth souls is wise. But, Lord, we know that wisdom begins always with the fear of God. 
the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We want to be those who honor and fear your name as a huge, massive part of our whole being, that we will then be those who love and serve you. So we pray that you will help us, Lord, to rest in the truth that we've had and in the certainty of the resurrection and in the resurrection life that Christ has given. So we pray, Lord, that you will be with us in a mighty way uh, th throughout the rest of this week.